Open your Bibles, please, to the book of First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 16, your Schofield Reference Bible, page 336. That's 336. Beginning with verse 14, we'll read responsibly through the 23rd verse. First Samuel 16, verses 14 through 23. We'll, of course, stand as we always do and stand for the reading of God's Word. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee, that our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that it can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person. And the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and became his armor-bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. And let's pray. Father, what a wonderful day. Thank you for... The fact that it's Sunday, thank you for the pleasant weather, thank you for the family gathering here at the church house once again. What a wonderful place to be, and thou dost meet with us faithfully, and once again we've come expecting to be blessed from thy word and to know the power of thy presence once again in this place. Save those who are lost, please. Help those who are saved to be Closer drawn to thee, bless the preaching of thy word and our preacher, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, one old song like that beats a lot of these little ditties. Like the dog Shep died, and I was comforted by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I thank God for those old songs. I I love the old ones. And uh, you say it's because you're an old man. No, I love everything. I love things that are tested. Uh, a new song, you don't know how long it's going to live, but you know the old songs have been tested. Tested in revivals and tested in churches and so forth. Enough of that. I won't speak this morning on the subject, I am a moody person and so are you. I am a moody person and so are you. I mean, I'm like, I'm like Dwight Moody and you have spells. That's what I'm talking about. And... Uh, but uh, let's see if I can get this little thing on here. And uh, you just uh, read a while ago the story of of uh, uh, the king, Saul, who became moody and called for someone. Uh, someone suggested, why don't you have somebody who can play the harp? And David was a harpist, and uh, that's why your wife comes. She's she harped. Uh, anyway... Uh, uh, David was a harpist, and so they asked David to come, and he played, and uh, you know the story. Now, this morning, I want you to listen very carefully. I promise you I'm going to help you. And uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning on that subject. I am a moody person, and so are you. Father, bless me as I speak, and our people as they hear. I pray that you'll help us to get something accomplished in our lives through the hour. In Jesus' name, amen. When a dozen or more people, within a matter of a couple of weeks, come to me with the same problem, I try to address that problem 
often in the pulpit. For example, in my counseling, if I see uh, like a, sort of like a, a Gallup poll or a, a, a presidential poll or something, if I they they can take a thousand people across America and pretty well judge how some election is going to turn out. And uh, I can take pretty well a dozen people that come to me with the same problem and feel like that problem perhaps should be addressed in the pulpit because it means that not only that dozen, but thousands of people uh, no doubt have the same problem, such is the case this morning. Several people have said to me, Brother Hiles, uh, in, in marital counseling especially, I admit I am a moody person. And they often say, I wish I were like you. Well, the truth is, you are like me, and you're like Johnny Colston, and you're like Lee Robertson, and you're like, uh, uh, who else is up here? You're like everybody else. Uh, you are You're like Dwight Moody was. You're like John Rice was. Uh, everybody, as I said in my title, is a moody person. First Corinthians 10.13 10, says, There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That means that if one person has moods, all of us have moods, and all of us are moody people. Moods sweep over, over us independently of our will or choice. It may be the weather, it may be the diet, it may be chemical problem, it, it, it may be any number of things, but the truth is, everybody in this room is moody. I've gotten up many a time in my life, and I didn't want to face the day. You say, you are like me? Oh yes, I'm like you. I, I've gotten up many times in my life when I did not want to face the day. Some mornings, I run to the coffee cup as fast as I can. I always start off with the Bible. I can do all things through coffee which strengthens me. <laughs> I read those verses because I like, to, I like to drink my coffee and feed myself on the Word of God at the same time. Or all things work together for good to those who drink coffee. To those who are caffeined according to those grounds. I love that verse. Uh, uh, and I read that verse as I drink my coffee. Or, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a coffee. Or, coffee is my shepherd, and I shall not faint. You know all those scriptures about it. And uh, now I know what you're doing. Some of you health food people are sitting in your pharisaical seat right now. And uh, yeah, you, I won't preach the truth. I don't, uh, but... I told my Sunday school class this. I'm going to tell you this, too. I lost my confidence in one of our college faculty members of the day, and his wife, who also is employed by us, Mario Corso. I didn't lose much confidence because I didn't have much confidence in him. But but uh, the Corsos are health food people. I mean, to them, coffee is a dirty six-letter word. C-O-F-F-E. Six-letter word. And... Uh, and uh, Coke is a dirty four-letter word to them. And, uh, uh, in fact, we, we've, we've called them before when we had a little problem and said, what's good for this? And they, they can tell you, know, you know, like uh, elephant's toenails are good for this. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, octopus soup is good for this. And Brother Young, for example, is, drink, is drinking uh, chicken feet soup. And if I was going to take chicken soup, I wouldn't get the feet, I'll tell you for sure. But... Uh, uh, the, the quote souls, they're that kind of people. They, they just don't eat like we eat. The other day, Ms. H uh, Friday night, Miss Howes and I went out to eat. We always decide this way. I'll choose three restaurants, and she'll choose one of the three. Well, the next week, she chooses three, and I choose the one of the three. Well, this particular time, one of us chose three restaurants, and, oh, something like maybe uh, uh, Olive Garden and Cracker Barrel and... Uh, and this at the particular night, Chi-Chi's, and the other person chose Chi-Chi's that night. I hate to even tell you this. <laughs> but I'm going to expose sin wherever I see it. <laughs> we, we walked in Chi-Chi's, and Miss House came. I, I always drive her up and let her out at the door, and then I go out and park and come back. And... Uh, so she's waiting on me. She said, guess who's here? I said, who? She said, the court souls are here at Chichi's Mexican restaurant. I walked over, we walked over, and there they sat. The greasiest bunch of plate food you ever saw in your life, Mrs. Quotso. And 
You know what? She was drinking a Coke. Like Brother Moffat said the other day, he said, I, I eat health food. And I looked at him and saw him eating something greasy. He said 75% of the time. <laughs> but but uh, I, I, told, I told the coach souls, I said, I'd rather see my mother drunk. <laughs> now back to the meat of the sermon. I, I'm, I'm saying that all of us, uh, have moods. I was, I was talking about uh, coffee is my shepherd, I shall not faint, and so forth. And uh, there are days when, when I, I just barely make it to the coffee cup. You say you? Yeah, me. I'm talking about me. Um, not only that, uh, I picked up the paper yesterday and looked at the weather report for today. And here's what I read. Something like this. Dallas, 80 high, 60 low, sunny. I wanted to TP every house in Dallas. Los Angeles, 85 for a high, 67 for a low, and fair. Jacksonville, 84 high, 62 low. Don't hold me to these figures, but they're about right. Sunshine, Little Rock, 78 high, 57 low, partly sunny. Chicago, Sunday night, lower 27, snow. And I said, bah humbug! I love the summers here. I love the falls. I love the winter. Sort of love the winter. You say, how about spring? We don't have them. But, but I'm saying that, that I am capable of being a little depressed just like you are. And so is Dr. Robertson. And so was Billy Sunday. And so was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And so are all these men on the platform. I don't always know what causes them, but sometimes I'm in a despondent mood, sometimes as you are. Sometimes I'm in a good mood, sometimes a bad mood, sometimes a sentimental mood, sometimes a sad mood, sometimes a mischievous mood. I'm, uh, and you're the same way. I go from being a Johnny Colston to an Ed Lapina. That's a long trip. And then I, be, I, I go to being like Jeff Owens. And then I try to get sweet. I go from Johnny Colston to Ed Lapina to Jeff Owens to Keith McKinney to Phil Sally to Roy Moffat and then to suicide. <laughs> I, uh, uh, and you say, preacher, are you serious? I'm serious. And by the way, so do you. Now, there are people you say, like somebody like Miss Colston. I've never seen her in working with her 36 years. 36 years. I've never seen her out of sorts. Have you? <laughs> Have you ever seen her in sorts? I didn't say shorts. I said sorts. <laughs> now, I, I, I never have. But I have never seen her when she acted discouraged. I mean that. I mean, she, she's, you think she's putting on. She, 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 if she is, she's putting on all the time. Now, but I guarantee you that she's moody. Because all of us are. And all of us have times of depression. And all of us have times of fear. All of us have times of melancholy. And all of us have times when we are on top and times when we're on bottom. Uh, all of us have times when we, ought to, when we run for the coffee cup, except the court souls, they run for Mexican food. Last Sunday night, for example, I was a bit discouraged and I walked through the door. You didn't know it, couldn't tell it, but I was. Last Wednesday night, when I walked through the door, the last thing I said, I, I'm so tired, I don't know if I can make it tonight or not. You didn't know it, but I was. Um, uh, Sunday morning after pastor school, I, I fought a little bit being a little blue, but I always do fight that after pastor school. You say, Brother House, sometimes you walk to the pulpit and, 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 and you're not on top side. I'm on top side, but I have to work on being on top side. And so do you. Now, uh, let me talk to you this morning. I do not want to discuss with you this morning how to prevent moods. Uh, yes, I have a few... Uh, uh, ex mental exercises that I use to try to 
get myself back on top side and, and uh, lift myself from being down. But those exercises are not the object of my discussion this morning. I want to discuss with you what to do while having these moods. I want to talk to you this morning, and I, pro I promise you that you need to listen to me. I want to talk to you this morning. You, you said, I'm just not in a very good mood today. Or, boy, I feel great today. Now, I could discuss with you how to prevent these moods. I, I, uh, I could not successfully help you prevent them, but I could help, help you uh, lessen them maybe or have fewer of them or teach you better still how to get out of them, but that's not my discussion today. I want to talk to you today about what to do when the moods come. Now, I'm going to use three examples in the Bible of the wrong way. Number one, Saul. Saul. You read a while ago, Brother Colston, we read it together about King Saul. King Saul became depressed. He became blue. He became melancholy. Had a, uh, an evil spirit, the Bible says. What, what it meant was that he didn't feel well. He was downcast. Somebody said, won't you have somebody to play the harp for you? So young David was called. He was a harpist. And young David was called. And he came and played the harp for King Saul. Now King Saul made a mistake. That's not the way that you overcome moods. The truth is, he tried to cure it and call for help. And that's never the way to do it. He addressed it. And that's not the way to do it. He tried to master it, and that's not the way to do it. He tried to fight it, and that's not the way to do it. Now, follow me carefully. When you try to fight a mood, you're thinking about the mood. That's what's wrong with modern psychology. They address or approach the mood. And every time you approach the mood, you're thinking about the mood, and you dig yourself deeper and deeper. And that's what the modern psychologists want, because they want you to come back at 100 bucks an hour. I'll tell you what. Uh, before I'd go to a psychologist because I was depressed, I believe, I, I believe I'd just go ahead and be blue the rest of my life. Now, the truth is, you're not going to overcome moods. Listen to me now. I'm talking to you, and you need to help me. You can yawn when you get home. Listen to me now. You're not going to overcome your moods by addressing your mood. King Saul, uh, if that's the truth, King Saul wouldn't have tried to kill David. That's the truth. King Saul would have come right out of it. He did temporarily come out of it because the music, but when the music quit playing, he was right back in it again. So I'm saying, don't address it. And don't, don't go to somebody. And you, you come to me. But the house, I'm in the mood. What can I do? Old story. I've told it many times. Remember Mrs. Stinson. Mrs. Stinson was a lovely lady, prematurely white hair. I guess she was middle-aged when I came here. She's in heaven now. And Mrs. Stinson, uh, and she's listening to me, so, uh, but she can't do anything about it unless she's got in charge of those levers up there. But, but uh, she, uh, she came to me one day, and she was, a, she was a, a, a musician and a lovely, dignified, refined lady. She came to my office one day, and she's shaking like this, literally shaking. And she said, Brother Hiles, I think I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. Well, that's not a surprise to me. Every lady I know is having a nervous breakdown. Or just had one, or is planning to have one as soon as she can work it into her schedule. She said, can you help me? I said, yes, ma'am. That's a southern way to say yes, ma'am. I said, yes, ma'am, I can. And I can. I can help anybody in this room prevent a nervous breakdown. I can help anybody in this room prevent uh, cracking up, or what they call it now, uh, 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 burning out. Burning out. Best way in the world to keep a car, not to get a car not run, is don't burn it. Keep it running, it'll be okay. Let it sit and not run. Oh, I won't go into that. She said, I'm about to crack up. Can I help you? I said, yes, ma'am, I can. Can you help me? She said, what? What can I do? I said, go home, bake some cookies. She said, what cookies got to do with my nervous breakdown? I said, take them to a deaf family and take a little uh, tea or something or a cold drink or uh, get some Coca-Cola from the court stores. And, and take that and uh, take it to a deaf person. And write a little note there that you love them, you're praying for them, and cheer them up. I said, then bake a cake. And I said, take the cake the next day to a blind person and take a, some, a spot of tea 
uh, or, or, or coffee, depending on what kind of mood you're in, and, uh, and take it and, and tell them you love them and spend some time with them. And the next day I said to her, get yourself a dozen roses and go to St. Margaret's Hospital. Walk up and down the corridors of the hospital, finding every room you can where nobody's visiting, nobody has a visitor during visiting hours. Walk in there and cheer them up. I said, that'll... See, you don't, you don't get over your nervous breakdown by facing the nervous breakdown. You don't get over your mood by facing the mood. And I said, forget that you, forget you live. Think about somebody else. Lord, let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes. And that's your problem. That's what got you blue in the first place. You're thinking about yourself. She said, I don't see what cookies and cake and roses have been my nervous breakdown. I didn't see her for several months. If she did see me coming, she would turn around and walk away. One day she was walking down past the telephones over there in the Miller building, the office building, toward walking east, and I was walking south down the hallway where the offices are. We came there to the place, and we bumped into each other. And I cut up, and I stepped back, and I said, Oh, we've got a quick meeting like this, Mrs. Stinson. And she said, she turned to walk away. I said, Hold it. You're not walking away from me. You've been avoiding me for several months. I said, how about that nervous breakdown? And she laughed and she said, I got so busy I called it off. Now, now you listen to me. King Saul made the mistake of his life when he faced it. King Saul should have gone to the jail and visited somebody. King Saul should have gone to the hospital and visited somebody. King Saul should have gone to somebody that's hungry and fed them. But King Saul was thinking about himself. You'll never get out of your moods by facing them. And try, how, oh, how can I, step one, step two, step one, step two is forget yourself and think of somebody else. I turned to the second person that made a mistake, and that is Ahab. God bless Ahab. I love the guy, only because he had to live with Jezebel. Ahab was a henpecked king. I got more respect for a pimp than a henpecked man. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. Uh, if you're henpecked, that means you're married to an old hen. Now, 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 Ahab married to Jezebel. Ahab is a certain uh, vineyard that he wanted. It was adjacent to his. He was the king. He's used to getting what he, whatever he wanted. He tried to buy Naboth's vineyard, and Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. And, and Ahab got so discouraged, he went to bed, turned his face against the wall, and pouted. Now, that's the mistake. What did he, what did he do? He, he, uh, he took the day off. Folks, look, when you're in a mood, don't take the day off. When you're in a mood, don't, uh, 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 don't sleep in. Don't miss church. People say, well, the house, I didn't feel good. I, 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 I just a little bit uh, feel, didn't feel good. I stayed home from church. That's when you need church. So uh, don't, don't stay home from church. Don't miss church. Face the issues. Face life. Hey, Ahab. Face it. Don't go home and try to avoid it. Face it. So I'm saying uh, Ahab made a mistake. Number three, Jeremiah. Saul tried to face it and cure his mood. Ahab wouldn't face it. Had turned his face to the wall. Jeremiah. Jeremiah quit. He just absolutely threw in the towel and quit. And uh, now... That's another thing. Don't quit when you're in a mood. In fact, don't make decisions that are major. I know a preacher. Look, you, you, you couples, quit leaning on each other back there. Straighten up. Uh, this is not time to lean on your husband's shoulders. Good night. Sit up and listen to me. If you're sick, go home and go to bed. If you're not, sit up straight like everybody else. I'm in a bad mood. I'm getting a bad mood in a hurry if I see you sort of making out in church. But anyway, um, where was I before I got in this bad mood? Uh, yeah, I know a preacher was preaching one Sunday morning, and, and the pianist didn't show up. And, and, and the organist didn't show up. Same morning. The preacher got so upset, he stood up and said, By the way, this is my last Sunday. I mean... He got in a bad mood and resigned. He told me, by the way, he has never since then had a great church. He had a good ministry. I know another preacher. 
that was preaching one Sunday morning and folks weren't responding, much like it is this morning here. And the folks weren't responding. And the preacher said, by the way, next Sunday is my last Sunday. He had built a great church. He's never built a church like that since. He built a, and the reason is he made a decision while he was in a mood. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. If, if I talk, I've talked to four people in the last 60 days who at one time were employed at Howells Anderson College, four different people, and not together. None of the four knew the other three talked to me. Everyone said, I left Howells Anderson College in a moment of a decision, a moment when I was down, and it's the biggest mistake I made in my life. By the way, don't make the same mistake. It's the biggest mistake I made in my life. All four of them. And by the way, they're all four of my friends, and none of them left because they're mad at me or anybody else. They just left because maybe their salary wasn't as big as they thought they should make or could come in, and they left. Now listen to you carefully. You have a chance at Howells Anderson College to affect the entire nation. I'd rather make half the amount of money and help change America than make twice the amount of money and just so I can could, I could, I could live a little bit more, more easily and more luxurious. Now you listen to me carefully. There's something going on here at First Baptist Church of Heaven. I got a letter open this morning from an evangelist. And he said to me, he said, the more I travel across this country, the more I realize the influence that you and First Baptist Church and Howells Anderson College have on this country. Don't you let your selfishness keep you from being a part of something that's changing the whole world. The greatest missionary college in the world is Howells Anderson College. The college that's sending out the most Christian school teachers is Howells Anderson College. And the great churches in America are being built, uh, 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 many of them, by Howells Anderson College graduates. And I want to be a part of this historic church and this historic college. And don't, the fact that you're so up close to it, don't let it step back and see what's going on. And I'm trying to say they made decisions when they were down and discouraged. Don't ever make a decision while you're down. Now, let me say this quickly. Saul decided he was going to let music cheer him up. Now, I'm not against music. I'm, I'm a good singer myself. Just want to see if you're still listening. I'm not opposed to music. I am opposed to, to you choosing music to determine your mood. Or art. Anything else like that. Do not change what you do when you're in a mood. Most important thing I said, listen carefully. Do not change what you do when in a mood. If there's any time you don't need to take a day off, it's when you're in a mood, bad mood. Any time that you need to stay on schedule. You can schedule yourself out of your mood better than you can take off and get out of your mood. So stay on schedule. Um, do not change what you do. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. And don't change your mind while you're in a mood. You've heard this many times. 37 years ago, 38 years ago, this coming summer, I came to preach my first sermon as a guest at First Baptist Church of Hammond. I did not want to come to Hammond. I was very content. Our church in Garland, Texas. But the Lord, and we won't go through the whole story about how we got called. You, you, don't, I don't, you don't want to hear it. I don't want to tell it. But I was convinced that God wanted, wanted us to come to Hammond. I want to say this too, by the way, fellas. I would never have come to Hammond if she vetoed it. I will never tell my wife we're moving. If God wants me to move, he'll tell both of us. So we felt that we ought to come to Hammond. I resigned my church in Texas. It was such a heart-wrenching thing that immediately I felt like I'd made a mistake. I was crushed. I was all the way on the bottom. And uh, I felt like I'd made a mistake. But it wouldn't change my mind. I didn't go back to the church and say, I changed my mind. I, I made a mistake. I would not undo while I was in a bad, heartbroken mood, what I had done rationally and prayerfully. <clears throat> Listen, couples get divorces they wish they didn't get 
by making a decision while they're in a the mood. Pastors leave churches they should have kept <coughs> by making a decision while they're in a the mood. No, listen, if you surrender your life to mission field, for example, it shouldn't be because you feel good someday. It should be because you feel that God wants you to go to the mission field. Now, <coughs> I'm saying, don't keep doing what you're doing. Keep living by your schedule. People say about me, <coughs> Brother Howells, he's always the same. No, he isn't. But listen carefully. He always does the same. He is not always the same, but he always does the same. If I feel like walking through that door, I walk through that door. If I don't feel like walking through that door, I walk through that door. If I feel like reading that Bible, I read that Bible. If I don't feel like reading the Bible, I read that Bible. If I feel like praying, I pray. If I don't feel like praying, I pray. Listen, they say that more people commit suicide during the Christmas season than any other time. You know why? Because they're off schedule. If you're in a mood... Follow, bad mood, follow your schedule. Keep doing the same thing. People say, Brother Howells never changes. Oh, yes, he does change, but what he does doesn't change. <laughs> Some of you folks aren't listening to me. You aren't listening to me. You know why I stayed at this church for 37 and a half years? Because I stayed when other men were left. <laughs> you know why Lee Robertson stayed at Holland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga 40 years? Because when he faced the battles that caused other men to quit and turn back, he did not leave. He stayed in the storm and in the calm and in the valley and on the mountaintop. And that's why I'm behind this pulpit today is because I did not let my moods determine my decisions. <laughs> my Uncle Harvey, I, I, I often mention him. As I said the other day, you, 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 you're a lot like your Uncle Harvey was. He was a very handsome man. Charming person. No, Uncle Harvey was cheerful. Now, let me say this. I choose to act cheerfully whether I feel cheerful or not. That's what I'm talking about. That's what she does. Well, well, why, why are you like that? I'm just in a bad man. Now, Uncle Harvey, always friendly. I, I get my satire from Uncle Harvey. And you hate him now, don't you? I get my little quips from Uncle Harvey. He'd walk down the street and see the postman and say, Good morning, Uncle Sam. I walk in. The other day, Ms. Howe's buying a dress for Easter. Well, I was buying it. Just trying it on. I've never understood why it takes a woman 15 minutes to change one dress. Anyway, that's just near the end of that. But uh, I said to the lady, and it was a, a dress that was moderately priced, maybe a little expensive. And I said, This is the dress that was on sale advertising Hammond Times for $9.95, isn't it? That's Uncle Harvey. I got that marvelous personality. Feel free to say amen if you want to. <laughs> Uncle Harvey. <coughs> Uncle Harvey had a stroke. Put him in a wheelchair. But he kept on being Uncle Harvey. <coughs> Are you trying to tell me he never got blue? Are you trying to tell me a man that's 70 years and a half now never gets blue? Are you trying to tell me that when I when I got sick this winter and was sick almost all winter long, I wondered you trying to tell I didn't wonder if this was the illness going to end my ministry? I was sick from November fifteenth to, to March the tenth and took th three different rounds of antibiotics. I took Sudafeds and Hudafeds and Dramatabs and Dramamine and, and Dramanice and all the rest of it. I, 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 I gargled with everything you can gargle. I took uh, uh, apple cider vinegar and honey. I took vodka. Everything I could find, I took. That's what finally did it. Are you trying to... T that, that grandmother that's always in a good mood, don't you think she ever wonders how long she's going to live? 
That grandfather that cheers you up, you little punk old 15 year old, he cheers you up and you ought to be cheering him. Ever dawn on you, he wonders if he may have a stroke in your day? Ever dawn on you when I walk in here on top side that I never think about the fact that G.B. Vick died at my age? That I've outlived Charles Spurgeon by, many, by, by probably uh, 12 years? H.A. Ironsides died about my age? Ever dawn on you that Dr. Cedarholm began to get senile when he was 70? You say, preach, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say I have learned to keep busy and keep on my schedule and keep doing what I'm supposed to do and get my mind as much as I can off things that would depress me. Quit thinking about yourself and think about somebody else. Sorry, Uncle Harvey, I, got, I forgot you for a while. Uncle Harvey never lost it. Except there with a, with a stroke. It affected his speech for a while. I told him I never lost his spirit. Had a heart attack. I never lost his spirit. Got diabetes. Never lost his spirit. I'm going to use an old illustration that you've heard many of you have with a new, new word he said. Doctor came and said, Mr. Harris, you're going to have to have your leg amputated. Uncle Harvey was in his 70s. I went to the hospital, was with him when they rolled him out of his room. His family went down to eat a bite. I stayed right there with the bed. I wanted to be there when he got back. When they rolled him back after amputating his leg, I think it was about right, just right below the knee. They rolled him back a little early, and I was the only one there. I sat there and watched him till his eyes would open a little bit. And finally, his eyes <coughs> opened. And Uncle Harvey looked up at me and said, Son, I learned something in the operating room. And they cut my leg off. I expected him to say, I've learned the grace of God is sufficient. Or he's able. Or God was with me. I said, Uncle, what did you learn? He said, when they cut my leg off, I learned the greatest cure for an ingrown toenail in the whole world. <laughs> they got his leg, but didn't get his spirit. Here's the illustration. I asked him one day, <coughs> Uncle, what's the secret? Stroke, still on top side. Heart attack, still on top side. Diabetes, still on top side. Amputated your leg, you sitting there in a wheelchair. And I said, Uncle, what's the secret? Let me tell you, and I'm quoting word for word. Here's what he said. Son, here's the secret. I make them roll me to work. I make them roll me to work. Stroke, heart attack, diabetes, amputated leg. Still went to work. Still went to work. Ladies and gentlemen, don't make the mistake of a saw trying to get over your mood by Bach. I'm not against Bach. I love Bach. My favorite Bach is Bach in the Hills where I was born. I love Carry Me Bach to Over Jenny. Those are my favorite Bach songs. But now, don't... Saul said, get somebody to play the harp. Saul, I'm sorry. What you ought to do is go to work. And live for your schedule. And pretty soon, through your regular routine of life, you're going to come back to where you were after a while. Don't make the mistake that Jeremiah made and quit. Make a decision that will affect your entire life adversely. And don't make the mistake that Ahab made. And get so discouraged. That you go to your room, turn your face toward the wall, and don't face life as it is. Mrs. Stinson overcame hers. Cookies, cakes, and flowers, roses. I'm not, I'm not saying that you'll never have a mood again. I'm simply saying don't, listen carefully, I will close. Don't let your mood determine what you do. 
let your will determine what you do. And don't let your mood determine how you act. You didn't know how tired I was Wednesday night. You didn't know I was a little discouraged last Sunday night. You didn't know that. And I don't want you to know it. I want you to know it now so you can feel sorry for me. I didn't want you to know it. I didn't want you to know how tired I was and pastor school was over and how I was a little bit down that Sunday. Well, I didn't want you to know it. Tell you exactly why. Bless God. I want to act the same way and do the same thing. Brother, I'm not saying you won't have a mood, but you don't have to be controlled by your mood. And your actions don't have to be controlled by your mood. Let your will decide the way you behave and your actions. Would you bow your heads, please? No one leaving.